Well, g'day, curd nerds. G'day, curd nerds. Well, 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 g'day, curd nerds, and welcome to another Ask the Cheese Man. This is episode 195, and uh, yeah, well, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, for those who don't know, I'm Gavin Weber. I'm the Chief Curd Nerd, and I will attempt to answer your home cheese-making questions. Uh, we Don't forget, we are live on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch today. Uh, and obviously, if you're there, you're watching it, so that's fantastic. All righty, uh, so let's have a look at the chat and we will say g'day to a few people before we do the intros and all that sort of stuff. Um, g'day to Chucky, uh, Liana, hello Liana, lovely to see you. Uh, one, two, three, four, hello, how are you? Doggos, I've got two little doggos here who want to say hello. Do you want to say hello straight away? All right, come on, you come up first. Oh, there's Hamish. Thank you. You can look at the cameras over there, mate. And Hamish needs a bath, so he'll be having a bath after the show. Bonnie, come here. Oh. And there's Bonnie, and she's lovely too. Kiss, mm, kiss. Oh, that's a cuddle. All right, Dan, you get. Go and play. All right, hopefully. Oh, she's giving me a grass burr. Right, hopefully they will be quiet in the background. That would be nice. If not, then I'll probably have to do some weird stuff. But anyway, um, what else we got? Cecilia, how are you? Bill, g'day, Bill, how are you? Uh, Shannon, lovely to see you. Ooh, who else we got? Steve, g'day, Steve, lovely to see you, mate. Um, Windwolf Alpha, oh, long time at no see on the stream. Lovely to see you. Rhett, g'day, Rhett. James, Cease, Judy, Ian. What else we got there? Craig, g'day, Craig, over on Facebook. Uh, Zakiria, I think that's how you say it. Lovely to see you. Angela, hello, Angela. Uh, Jim, Michael, Dominique, g'day, mate. How are you? Uh, Kevin, Aaron, g'day, Aaron. And hello, Shiny and Strangerland and Livestock. Great name. I think that's probably your YouTube channel. And Townsteading, Addy, how are you? Um, and Buston, Buston's Com, Texas Woodcraft. Good look at everybody, haven't we? And you can see the doggos in the, where are they? That side, down there, mucking around. All right. Um, let's, uh, right. So, yes, show notes, stuff to talk about. So, a uh, big thank you to Lindsay for the thumbnail for this show. It was uh, shown on the gallery last week, uh, the Formaggio or Bracchio. Um, new YouTube members uh, this week is Celeste Fraser. Thank you, Celeste, for your financial support. And thank you to all the YouTube members and patrons uh, who support the show financially on a weekly basis. Uh, good news, Kim is back moderating next week, so we can have links and all that sort of stuff that we don't normally have. Um, now, the last week I announced the giveaway, and uh, the winners were Hayden from the ACT in Australia. He won the cheese trier. And Elaine from Quebec in Canada won the mouse pad, and both of those prizes have been sent off. Uh, and the recipients informed so that was lovely um patricia who may or may not be on the chat i haven't seen her is patricia there no patricia yet um uh, she sent me the fundy fog recipe you now you probably saw the picture of that a couple of um uh, uh, uh galleries ago so that was pretty cool now great news um i've Pulled my finger out now that Kim's a bit better and uh, is recovering well. She'll be on light duties at work next week. So uh, this weekend I've had the time to actually make some cheese, which is fantastic. And I know you're all chaffing at the bit for new cheese videos. 
um, because they're so much fun to make. So uh, yesterday I made um, carcio ricotta, which is a very simple Italian farmhouse style cheese, and it comes in many varieties. So I just made the the plain and simple version, and you can put all sorts of stuff in that. So that's good fun. Um, and today I'm making gorgonzola, which is a bit of a challenge because it's a little bit fairly technical, blue cheese. So we'll be doing that. And what I also have done is um, started up a Trello board. I don't know if anybody's familiar with Trello. Um, let me just uh, show. And I'll be showing this every week. So it holds me accountable uh, per se. Now let me just uh, bring it up and share the screen and share the little windio. Rightio. So uh, this is my Trello board. Um, as you can see, lovely cheesy background, all that sort of stuff. So I've got in one column video ideas uh, where I've managed to find a recipe uh, and have, haven't yet scheduled it. So in my ideas board, I've got Danbo, which is a Danish cheese, triple cream, and Jack in the Box, uh, which was sent in to, uh, by one of my uh, viewers. Um, and then in pre-production planning, where I'm waiting for a production date, we've got Cachota, I think that's how you say it, uh, Fundy Fog by Patricia, of course. And currently shooting and not doing any editing yet is um, Cacho Ricotta, as you can see there. And we've got Gorgonzola Dolce. Um, so those two are, are being produced this weekend. I haven't started editing yet, but it's a really good, uh, and it's not sponsored by Trello or anything like that. I'm not even paying for it. So it's it's not a trial. This is all the basic uh, out-of-the-box sort of stuff you can do. Uh, and behind each board is some really cool stuff. So things like, um, you know, when the date, when it's due, the description of the cheese. So I don't mark it up when I would do the video. Uh, a little picture, the recipe, any videos I've found on YouTube about it, uh, and a little checklist. So like down here, order milk. So I did that. <laughs> Schedule a date, a date uh, which I did as well. Make uh, the video and the cheese, mature the cheese. And the last thing I don't have on the list, which I should put in, is uh, uh, release the video. Uh, so we'll put that little check mark in there. So that's that easy to do. So... Really cool little tool, uh, auto saves and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, like I said, not sponsored by Trello or anything like that. It's just a, a great tool that I'm using to keep not only myself accountable, but to um, to jot down any suggestions that you kind uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, curd nerds um, have given me. So that's really cool. So that, that, that'll help. Um, and uh, some sad news. Uh, there is no gallery today. Nobody sent in any pictures to me, uh, which is unfortunate. But good thing is I've gone back through all of my old uh, cheese thumbnails, pulled out some some perlers um, just to show you some of the cheeses that I've made uh, that you may not may or may not be aware of. So that's cool. All right. Um, let me uh go back and answer some questions because that's why you're all here of course uh and hopefully the doggies are set, starting to settle down I, I gave them two kongs you know those little round things and they're just playing in the background so that's cool all righty uh let's find a question uh steve has a question right here we go first question from steve thank you steve and for those who don't know, Steve makes curd harps, amongst other things, of course, and sells them on Etsy. And I've got a link down below, which is an affiliate link for his stuff. Uh, anyway, so the question is, my recent cheese came out bitter with a loss of moisture in the backpack bag. Very disappointing. It seems to be happening a lot. What am I doing wrong? A couple of things, Steve, I think. So cheese has come out bitter for a couple of reasons, either too much rennet, uh, which may or may not be the case. And this may be the case because the, the other clue is the loss of moisture in the vac bag. Um, and maybe another thing is too much culture because it sounds like the cheese is over-acidified. However, that can happen 
due to probably the root cause of the issue, and that is lack of salt. So remember that um, most cheeses, well, semi-hard, hard cheeses anyway, the ones you're probably vacuum packing, need between 2 and 2.7% salt per weight of the curds. So make sure that that is definitely the case. Now, I only ever see moisture in the backpack bag when a cheese is directly salted. Rarely do I see it when the cheese has been brined. Uh, usually it's directly salted. So usually it's because there's not enough salt and the, and the lack of salt does a couple of things. It, uh, it doesn't deter uh, quick proteolysis, which is breakdown of the proteins. Uh, it also lets the lactic bacteria continue to eat the lactose and expel and turn that into lactic acid. And that makes it bitter as well and sour. Um, and also it helps the, the whey will continue to release and weep. So that could be an issue. So it could be the salt. Um, sometimes it's a little bit too much um, starter culture. Remembering if you're using raw milk, use 25% less starter culture than what you would uh, normally. Anyway, hopefully that answered your question, Steve. Okay. Uh, the next question is uh, from Bill. And Bill said, uh, I did a halloumi a bit ago and it came out fairly hard. Did I cook it too long? Um, now, halloumi, uh, when, when you recook it, like you fry it, it should go a bit softer. Uh, that's for sure. It does look. It does go hard. I've had, um, I've stored halloumi that's been freshly salted in vacuum pack bags, and yeah, it does tend to go hard as the raw cheese. Uh, but once you've sliced it and cooked it, it softens up, uh, and that that's what we're worried about. We're not worried about the cheese hard when it's stored. So yeah, hopefully that helps, Bill. But yeah, look, you cook it as long as it needs to float, and that's it as far as um, uh, the, the halloumi process. Okay. Um, now, let's have a look. Uh, Liana says, um, if my aged cheddar is a bit bitter, uh, should aging it fix that? Uh, aging it longer fix that? Uh, Liana, yes, that's indeed the case. Um Especially with the cheddar style cheeses, uh, you haven't mentioned what it is. Down you get, come on, down you get. Um, with cheddar style cheeses, yeah, it, at three months, some of them tend to be a little bit bitter, um, uh, but um, age it longer, and you'll find that bitterness goes away. Uh, or it could be that salt issue that I talked about before. Um, do, do, do. Rhett says, my Havarti didn't turn out. There must have been something that got under the rind. Uh, it was gooey just under the rind. Is this uh, from not sanitizing properly? Could be. Um, usually it means there's some sort of ripening bacteria that's got into your cheese. If it goes gooey under the rind, that's a, a good example of um, brevi bacteria linens. Now, if it went a bit stinky on the outside um, and went a little bit red when you washed it, then yeah, that could uh, could definitely be the issue. Remembering that uh, brevi bacteria linens takes a, a fair while to establish its culture on the outside, um, and that tends to make just under the surface gooey if it hasn't gone all the way through. Um, so, yeah, so make sure everything's sanitized properly. If you're really having trouble and white vinegar doesn't work for you, try a weak bleach, bleach solution. <clears throat> per litre, you put in 20 millilitres of just normal household bleach and you rinse all of your, um, uh, your utensils and stuff like that if you can't boil them. So all the plastic stuff, your cheese press and all that sort of stuff. Oh, we've got a... Um, We've got a super chat first up off the bat. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And that made the curd alert nerd light. Rhett, I hope that answered your question. Let's get to the uh, super chat. Um, $100. Thomas, you must be a very rich man. I am humbled. Thank you so much. Um, that, that is amazing. Uh, so, yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Thomas. Um, we've been having some chats on Patreon, which have been great fun. So uh, thank you so much. 
Did you have a question, Thomas? You can't just throw $100 in there and not answer a question. So answer, ask a question in there somewhere. But thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. Okay. Um, back to the questions. In fact, that's the most, that's the highest super chat I think I've ever had. Um, so that that's amazing. Thank you so much. Um, rightio, let's. This is another question. I'm sure there's lots. Here we go. So we did the one from uh, Rhett on the Havarti. So Erin uh, has uh, more of a statement, I suppose. Greetings from California, USA. I just got two mini Jersey cows of my own. Uh, uh, I can finally make all the cheese. Indeed. Uh, Jersey milk is amazing. Very high fat content for cows. So... Um, enjoy that, Erin, and uh, enjoy looking after them. They are a treasure, and you get to love the girls. All righty. Um, Cease says, yay, Hamish is no longer wearing the cone of shame, and Bonnie is growing like a weed. Yes, yeah, she is, like the weeds in my garden. Um, yeah, she's a big girl now, and uh, she's doing big girl things like climbing up on my cheesy chair of wisdom here in the studio. And just being a little rascal, basically. Yes, Hamish, if I don't think I have announced it on the stream, Hamish had to go and get neutered. Um, and that is the main reason is because Hamish and Bonnie are half brother and sister. So we didn't want them to have a litter because um, it just wouldn't have been good. The, the gene pool's a little bit too close. So, um, yeah, so poor old Hamish got neutered and... Um, yeah, these things happen, of course. All righty. Um, yeah, next question is from uh, Townsteading. Says, uh, well, thanks for asking. Some Thanks for asking something. Um, trying my Colby again today. Going to heat treat the milk and see if that helps. Uh, definitely will. Um, if you do the low temperature long hold, it actually does preserve some of the enzymes uh, in the milk, in the natural raw milk. So that's the best heat treatment. Don't go for full pasteurization. Stick to the, um, was it 63 degrees, if I remember rightly, for 30 minutes. Um, yeah, so that low temperature pasteurization is more beneficial for the final taste of the cheese. Uh, and that'll fix a world of problems, especially things like late blown, which we've seen before um addy from uh the photos that you sent in um c says um hi gavin thanks for doing these sessions it's my pleasure every sunday morning gives me something to get out of bed for uh and i do love answering your questions if i can you know which is fantastic um anyway so i i've today i've waxed my farmhouse cheddar uh now that it's in the cheese fridge how often should i turn it uh, I turn my cheeses every Friday, so whether they need it or not, uh, because it kind of keeps me accountable for the affinage of the cheeses. Um, so every Friday, just give them a flip. It just helps distribute the um, the fats within the um, within the cheese, um, and they ripen a little bit better, and you don't get any too many problems. You can also the good thing is by turning it every week, you can then see if you're doing some natural rind cheeses. You will then be able to um, check if they've got any mold growth on it uh, and all that sort of stuff uh, and, you know, make any corrections as you need to go along during the ageing process. So there you go. That's how often you turn and check these things. If you're doing mold ripened cheeses, I do them twice a week. So once on uh, Tuesday and once on Friday. Uh, and that helps. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, Addy also says, nice use of Trello. I use ClickUp to manage my cheeses. Uh, another great little tool. All right, Lindsay says, um, hi, Gavin and Kim. I can't get enough of your content. Thank you. No, thank you, um, Lindsay. And uh, yeah, fantastic. Um, inspired by your Wensleydale with cranberries, I made two cheddars with cranberries. Both are now off-gassing in the vac pack. Any help will... Be great, yeah. The uh, the fruit does tend to produce a little bit of gas, as does the reaction with the sugars on the fruit as well. 
Um, all you do is just um, remove them from the back vac pack and then uh, you know clean them up if they've got any mold or anything on them and then re-vac pack and I should be good to go. Um, so hopefully that helps. Um, what I would do in between the two vac packings is um, let it dry out, air dry it for a day um, and the air should be a lot better. Um, uh, next question comes from, uh, uh, Ken, or it's more of a statement. Ken says, hello from Salet, sunny California. Thanks for all the cheese videos. Um, thanks mate. Appreciate it. Um, um, Addy says, uh, my next cheese to come out is Cotswold, but not until the 1st, the 1st of January, maybe. Um, I'll be sure to take and send pictures. That would be lovely. Thank you so much. Um, uh, in Chucky says, not to talk over you, but here in America where the uh, we're in the holiday season. We need all the cheese we can get. I bet you do. Uh, Connie says, hello. Hello, Connie. Lovely to see you, mate. All the way from Portland in Victoria. Um, and uh, Jim <coughs> says, has a question. Says, hello, Gavin. I have problems with the time I should start making cheese. So brining and flipping work out well. Uh, Some should, maybe. I start at... 6 a.m. at 1 p.m. Huh? Uh, giving timing suggestions. Uh, could give timing suggestions in your recipe. Um, the reason I don't give timings is it's up to the individual. Um, you know, take on some responsibility, I suppose. Um, because my timings aren't necessarily going to be the same as your timings. If you're using a different type of milk, you're using goat, sheep, um, yak, whatever... It'll take longer or take shorter, the rennet time and all that sort of stuff. We'll all be different. Um, as a guide, the best thing to do is watch through the video. There are timings within each of the videos. It says, wait for 30 minutes, wait for 20 minutes, blah, blah, blah. But as you get a little bit more experience under your belt, Jim, you shouldn't have too many problems working out how long it takes to heat up the milk, how long it takes to culture the, 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 um, the milk, how long it takes you to prep at the start. Sometimes, well, and because I've got lots of camera equipment and all that sort of stuff when I make a cheese, it takes me at least between 30 minutes and an hour set up just for the session. That's even before I start sanitizing the equipment. So you get used to it as you get into it. Uh, Nicola says that uh, she slept in, but that's okay, Nicola, you're here now. Um, Kevin says, is there some way to... Stabilize feta as it always goes soft after a while in the brine. Added vinegar and um, calcium chloride to the brine. Please advise. Look, Kevin, you've got to get the pH down to 4.3. So when you when you put the vinegar in, you may not be putting enough in. Um, a good thing to do is use the brine from the cheese that you made and uh it, it'll increase in um uh it will increase in acidity as well but if the brine doesn't have enough acidity so you have to check test it with ph strips or a ph meter so uh it's going to be the same as what the cheese because the final cheese will get down to the feta to make it crumbly the acidity development will be around 4.3 4.6 before it starts going crumbly so to stop that ion exchange between the the brine water and the cheese, um, the calcium uh, the calcium ions from the cheese exchange, and that's why it goes slimy on the outside. So, uh, yeah, definitely it's the pH, and once they're balanced, that ion exchange doesn't happen anymore. So, uh, yeah, muck around with your brine a little bit and test the acidity of it, mate. Um. Uh, which brings us to our next question, which is from uh, the retired chef. Um, says, can whey be used to make brine? Do you see any potential problems in doing so? Um, whey can be used to make brine, and a lot of cheesemakers do use the whey to make the brine. 
Uh, any potential problems? None that I see, because you've got to remember that whey has still got a little bit of calcium in it. It's a little bit acidic, which is good for the cheese when it's brining. It stops that slimy outside coating. So that's always a good thing. Um, so, no, I, look, I, of late, I think the last cheese that I made, well, the current Jan Creamy, for instance, I used the whey for the brine for that one. Even though that went a bit slimy because I didn't balance the pH, it still tasted fantastic. So, yeah. All righty. Um, Manuel, g'day, mate. How are you? Um, can decrease the amount of water when dissolving rennet to get stronger action for pasteurised homogenised milk? Uh, not really. That, that quarter of a cup um, suits most recipes. It, it doesn't dilute the milk per se. It doesn't give you stronger action. It just dissolves the rennet so that it can be distributed more evenly through the milk. That's the only reason that we're dissolving the rennet. Uh, and it also gives it a bit of a head start as well, especially if you're using tablet rennet. You really do have to dissolve it in water because you can't just throw the, the rennet tablet in there. You have to uh, put dissolve it in water and, and kind of make it into a suspension so you can tip it into the milk. Um, liquid rennet, a different story. Yeah, you sh some people do add the rennet directly to the milk without um, adding uh, water to it. Uh, non-chlorinated water, by the way. Don't use chlorinated water. It inhibits the rennet action. Um, and it also can kill any um, uh, any of the lactic bacteria that you're going to put in the cheese. Uh, so, no, it doesn't make any difference, Manuel. But great question. Nobody's ever asked that one before. Um, Shannon says, have you ever made a guido? Um, I haven't found a video on one. Tried making one the other day, coated in paprika, would love to see you make one. Yeah, there is a recipe for this Guido cheese. I think Guido invented it. Um, and uh, it's on the Facebook group, Learn to Make Cheese. So if you're a member of that Facebook group, there's lots of files with lots of videos, uh, not videos, lots of um, recipes, sorry, that you can grab. Do you need to, sorry, I've got to take Hamish outside. This is the trouble with, Kim not moderating. Back in a second. Let's, uh, let's, I'll be back. Come on, guys, outside. No barking. Oh, goodness me. That's live, isn't it? <laughs> All righty. Um, so I've written Guido on the list. I'll go and have a look at the recipe. I think it's like an Italian hard cheese. So that's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, thanks for that suggestion. Now, Jim Jackson, um, has been a member for 25 months. Uh, and that doesn't come up in, um, Restream, which is the software I'm using. But anyway, thank you so much, Jim, for all of your financial support. 25 months. That's massive. And I think um, there's quite a few other members that have been there a long, long time. Um, the, the, the top person, uh, I don't even know if he watches anymore, is um, is Andrew. He used to be an old work colleague when I worked at, um, at a bank uh, quite a while ago. Um, I was in IT security there. Um, and Andrew's been a member for 38 months. Anyway, Jim, thank you so much. Um, I do hope... That Miss Kim is doing better. Yeah, she's she is resting at the moment, but uh, she's been getting up and about. She's um, she has a nap in the afternoon when she needs to, you know, just to recover because that surgery is quite invasive, the hernia surgery that she had. So, yeah, um, she will be moderating next week, Jim. If you didn't get the the news on that up front, so um, thanks, mate. Appreciate it, and thanks to all of the financial members again. Uh, without it, I really couldn't do what we do um all right so kevin's got a question about um, any ideas how and when to use a cheese coating so there is this pva cheese coating that is sold in some places and uh it also has a mold inhibitor okay so and i can't remember the name of it but anyway it has a mold inhibitor so it's used in a lot of european cheeses things like um uh Gouda and Edom, um, even Leodama. Um, I know though, and even baby bills, you know, little baby bills. Um, oh, and that's 
fine for the gallery, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, so that PVA che cheese coating is just a polyvinyl acetate coating, um, a bit like paint, but better, and, it, and it's food safe. Um, so what you do, you use a brush and you can paint it over or you can dip it into this you know, bucket and get it out. And then once that's dried, then you can wax it. Okay, because you notice on baby bills, if you open up a baby bill, there's the red wax on the outside or green or whatever color. There's lots of little colors for baby bills these days. Um, and underneath, you'll see this white coating. That's the that's the PVA um, uh, mold inhibitor. So, yeah, that that's you can use it on semi-hard and hard cheeses, anything that you would normally wax or vacuum pack. So, um, and yeah, it's 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 a good little product if you can get your hands on it. I, I, for, I can't find it here in Australia for you know for me to buy wholesale, so it's 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 a difficult one. All right now, as I mentioned before, there are no gallery photos from the Curdner community. So what I've done is I've smacked together uh, a quick one this morning on some uh, interesting pictures. <laughs> let's let's go and have a look at the first one. Um, I really shouldn't be in the video production business with a thumbnail like this. So this is uh, this is Fontina, which is a great Italian cheese. Um, uh, it's it, it does become a hard cheese, but look at that face. Only a mother could love that, honestly. Um, so that's that's the first one. So there is a Fontina video if anybody ever wants to watch that. Uh, the next one is Greek feta. Now this was. Well, this was according to the traditional recipe. And you can see it's very crumbly. Um, so this was using 70% uh, goat's milk and, uh, sorry, 70% sheep's milk or ewes milk and 30% goat's milk. And it turned out perfect. And it wasn't slimy on the outside because I measured the pH of the, the stuff, the, the, of the brine. And you can see that the cheese is crumbly and it's a perfect Greek style. I should say Greek style because it's a PDO cheese. Um, and yeah, it, it turned out really well. So I was very proud of that cheese. Another cheese that I was proud of is uh, jalapeno uh, cheddar. So this was my is my standard um, farmhouse cheddar recipe, which you've seen over and over again. I've used it for different variations of adding things in. Uh, so like the farmhouse cheddar blue, that's a farmhouse cheddar. The jalapeno cheddar, I think even the, oh, no, I can't remember. Anyway, so this one, uh, great che cheese, jalapeno cheddar. I actually used fresh jalapenos and only aged it for three months. And the cheese turned out perfect. The flavor was great, a little bit of heat, not as hot as the triple um, uh, pepper jack. But yeah, this, this was a great cheese. So you go and check that video out. This one was my favourite cheese visually, uh, the marbled cheddar cheese. I got the idea from, well, I think it was Ruth Cohen, who's a regular viewer uh, and uh, YouTube member. So um, marbled cheddar cheese, I had to do it in two batches, stirring two pots, one with the uh, curds that had an arto in it and one with curds that didn't. A lot of people called it the planet cheese. It looks like it's got continents and oceans. Um uh, but, yeah, it kind of looks pretty cool, so I like that one. Uh, this was also a favourite cheese to make as well, queso Oaxaca. That's how you say it, Oaxaca. Um, so this is a Mexican string cheese, and it's wrapped into a ball like this. Uh, there's a fantastic video um, of me making the queso Oaxaca. Um, I really did enjoy this cheese, so, yeah, really cool. Um, and go and check that one out as well. This was my favourite party cheese, so raclette. And look at that bee linens. I'll tell you what, it was very orange. And it really did give it a nice, smooth, creamy texture on the inside. So this is a red mould, and uh, Brevi Bacteria Linens is the name of it. And, uh, yeah, the smear worked perfectly. So it turned out a great cheese. There's also a follow-up uh, party video where I had um, my friend David around and... Um, we uh, we consume the cheese on a little raclette uh, party clet thing, so that was cool. This one was probably the most ugliest um, cheese that I made. This was a mold ridden cheese. So this was um, pecoro. What was it? Pecorino uh, ricotta salata. So underneath this mold, these molds, 
which were all harmless. Um, and I scraped them off and the cheese was beautiful. Um, yeah, so I did a little video on, on rescuing a cheese that's mold covered like that. Notice there's no black mold, so that's good. A little bit of maybe pink, which is not so good. Um, but once I scraped it off and cleaned it up with a nice brine solution, it came up really well. This was another really unusual tasting cheese, and it was beautiful, really great hard, semi-hard cheese. No, it was a hard cheese. So saffron-infused uh, cheese, it's got a proper name. It comes from Sardinia, I think. Um, and, yeah, absolutely beautiful cheese. The flavour of the peppercorns were very subtle. The saffron flavour throughout the cheese, very nice. Had a really good afterbite. So great little cheese to make. You can go and check out that video. This one here, uh, the, the thumbnail, I think, really promoted the video. So Tropshire Blue looks a bit ugly. The inside is beautiful, and it's a very sharp and strong blue cheese. But, yeah, very delicious. It was difficult to make. All righty. Um, and that's it for the gallery today. Um, so thank you so much for looking. Now, if those who, if you want to send in the... Uh, if you want to send in a cheese making your cheese photos, hang on, let me just where where is it? Gavin, find it. Right, this is how you do it. So you go to my channel page, Gavin Weber. That's me. Uh, there I am. Uh, go and find me and cheeseman.tv. You can go there as well, and it takes you to the YouTube page. Pretty cool use of domain redirection there. But what you do, you go to the about tab here. Just like that. And you go down here to details. And it says for business inquiries. Now, you've got to log in to see the email address. So make sure you're logged in with your Google account. And uh, there you go. And you'll see that. And that is the only email address I check for gallery photos. So if you've made a cheese recently that you're proud of or not even proud of, send me the photos. I would love to show them in the gallery. You don't want to see another thumbnail gallery like that. Please send them in. Uh, like I said, go to the About tab of the channel, go down to Details, and you will get the email address uh, and send them through. So that's all very cool. Um, right. So I have to just get some two naughty dogs in before they get into too much mischief. So just one second, please wait. Come on, get out of there. Come on, let's go. Scooby Snacks. Inside. Good doggos. Right, sit. Sit. There you go. Be good. Right. Sorry about that. Back again. Um... Yeah, they were getting up to mischief outside. Right. So, anyway, uh, back with the questions. Uh, let's have a look. Let's have a look. Uh, Finker says, uh, yay, I caught one live whilst making a four-alarm cheddar. Four-alarm cheddar? Interesting. Um <laughs> Hello, Shiny says, uh, if you have cream from raw milk, is it better than shop cream? And what cheese could I make from the cream? Okay. Um, yes, the cream will be better than shop cream because most shop cream these days is they ultra pasteurize it um, and they actually remove some of the butter fat from it uh, and you don't get you know full thick cream that you would extract from raw milk. Now, um, I wouldn't make any... Oh, you could make... There's one cheese that you could make, and that's mascarpone. Uh, fairly simple. Get some tartaric acid, and that will coagulate the cream and make it thicker. Uh, there's a recipe in on the channel. Uh, make cultured butter. Cultured butter is so simple, and it's beautiful. It's delicious. So try cultured butter. Uh, there's a video on the channel for that as well. Thanks for your question. Hello, Shiny. Um, uh, da, da, da. Let's have a look. Um, uh, 
I'm looking for the next question. Just bear with me for a second. Um, Kevin says, do you have anything special planned for episode 200? It is sooner than you expect. Do I have anything special? Mm, I wish I could say yes. Um, Kim has told me that she's appearing in the 200th show. Uh, so stand by for that one. But I'm hoping that we make our first video for the Gavin and Kim channel first because uh, she wants to do a bit of an introduction and all that sort of stuff, and so do I. Don't want to throw her in the deep end and she gets stage fright and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, I'm hoping, Kevin, that Kim will come on the show and maybe sit next to me, wherever that may be, over here, um, and uh, can answer questions and uh, she can moderate on her laptop. Or we can set up, uh, like we did with some of the interviews during the um, 12 Hours of Cheese, um, you know, have a guest on and Kim can be my guest um, sitting in the background or doing what she's doing. I can set up another camera or she can go to the other studio, which is in the house. You know, the old one I used to be in with the little, very small room. Um, so, yeah, we could we could do that. But, yeah, that's kind of what I'm thinking of at the moment. Uh, I think that'll be good. I don't think there'll be anything else except maybe a party hat or something like that. Uh, okay, cool. Um, Ian says... I vacuum packed halloumi. One of the packs, and only one, has a strong yeasty smell that was so unpleasant. Unpleasant. Uh, I ditched it. Uh, anything I should do to avoid this? Uh, there's only a couple of things I can think of. Sanitation, of course. Make sure that's all tickety boo. Make sure all the stainless steel stuff is annual cheesecloth and all that. Uh, you don't use cheesecloth for halloumi. What am I saying? Oh, you should do. To, um, to press it under the boards. Um, make sure all that stuff's sanitised and boiled. Anything plastic, make sure it's sprayed with white vinegar. Or if you think you're still getting uh, infections and yeasts and moulds and stuff like that, then um, uh, use a weak chlorine solution. Uh, as I mentioned before, one litre of chlorine to 20 millilitres of... Oh, sorry, one litre... One litre of plain water with 20 mils of chlorine uh, and rinse everything off. You don't need to rinse it because it'll, it will it just dries and you don't get that residue or anything like that. Um, don't forget your hands. Your hands are, you know, they're covered in bacteria and, and yeasts. Um, that's why every time I handle the cheese, I always spray it with white vinegar. You don't always see that on the video because I don't always put it in there. But before I start the camera, I spray with white vinegar. Give my hands a good rub. It's a bit like hand sanitizer. Or you could even use hand sanitizer. It's up to you. Um, before you touch the cheese. And usually that is some source of uh, infection for some of the cheeses. It's the only thing I can think of. Um, keep your plastic back bags uh, rolled up tight before you use them. Don't let anything get in them. Any wild yeast. There's yeast everywhere in the air. Um, so yeah, it's very difficult to get rid of. Um, uh, there's a question from Rhett saying, um, do you have a video that explains the different types of mold, uh, what we want in a cheese and what to watch out for? Uh, I don't really know. Um, I don't think of it. So types of mold, I might be able to cobble something together from old footage. Uh, types of mold. It's a good suggestion for a technical video. Thank you, Rat. I'll see. I'll get on to that. Okay. Um, John Adams from England. Hello, John. Uh, did your cheddar? It didn't turn out with the taste, but had the vintage strength. Any ideas? Um, try a different starter culture. Um, I find that the best starter culture for a cheddar flavor a lot of people say just the standard mesophilic which is two cultures uh lactobacillus lactus subspecies lactus and lactobacillus lactus subspecies cremoris they're the two standard mesophilics um i find that using a um a complex uh, culture like ma 4000 series by denisco uh, is a lot better because it also has 
um, Streptococcus thermophilus, which is a thermophilic culture, as well as those two plus another one. Um, I can't remember another mesophilic. Um, anyway, it gives more complex flavors and, and a better cheddar flavor, if that makes sense. So try that. Try MA 4000 series of cultures, John. <clears throat> okay. Um, Lindsay says, another question, if I may. I made Yarlsberg yesterday and we'll put it on the K for a week before developing the eyes. Should I wax it for eye growth stage or leave a natural rind? Um, I tend to wax it, especially if you're doing Yarlsberg, Lindsay, because the, the rind tends to dry out too much and it won't expand as well. Um, the wax will split. Look, trust me, these things happen. Um, and But by the time it splits, the rind has gone hard enough that it won't get any mold infections, which is a good thing. So, uh, yeah, so do that. Wax. Wax is good. Vacuum pack, not so good uh, because it kind of restricts the growth of the, the eyes. Okay. Um, uh, Chris says, why can't we just throw rennet tablets into the milk? Uh, because what happens is where they dissolve, that area of the milk gets the rennet. Because remember, you only stir for one minute. That's not enough time for the rennet tablets to dissolve in the milk. So you'll get a lump of rennet and all the rest will be watery milk. That's why we do that, Chris. Great question, though. Um, uh, Mikkel says, hello from Denmark. Better late than never indeed, mate. Thank you so much for turning up. Um, uh, I don't understand the question, but Jim says, what was the remaining 40%? Not sure what that's in relation to, Jim. Sorry, mate. Um, okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, Beauty Fox 66. Great name. Um, hi, Gavin. Uh, finally made it. Oh, finished milking this morning and found you. Just wanted to say thank you for your recipes. They work brilliant every time. Every time my cheese always turns out. Thank you. Thank you, Beauty Fox 66. Um, righty. Uh, Patricia says In 2020, I used the bicolored curd method to make a variation of Shropshire Blue or Shropshire. Um, it turned out great. That sounds fantastic, Patricia. You always send in. You're very creative with your cheese making, I must say that. And the photos look amazing. And yeah, I don't know if I replied back. Yeah, I did get the Fundy Fog recipe. Thank you so much. Uh, and I'll be making a cheese over the next couple of weeks with that one. Um, let's have a look. Um, uh, hello, Shiny says, hi, Gavin. I've seen in the shops now you can buy smoked peppercorns. Uh, I'd like to see you make a cheese with these. They work well with Szechuan peppercorns mixed in uh, too as a mix. Um, Szechuan peppercorns, I'll tell you what, they have an amazing taste. Um, I remember going to an authentic Szechuan dining room here in Melbourne. We've got this restaurant. Uh, and when you go in there, there's only Chinese folk. There's no uh, Caucasians like myself. We went in there, we ordered uh, Kung Pao chicken which for those who know, do have Szechuan peppercorns in them. First time I ever tasted it, my tongue went numb and it was so hot from the dried chilies. It was just a beautiful dish made authentically. It was very, very good. Getting hold of Szechuan pepper though is, is difficult, but I would love to make a cheese with it and see what it tastes like. Um, smoked peppercorns too. That, that is interesting. Um, I've been meaning to do some more cheeses with peppercorns because I really do like the flavour. So, no, good suggestion. Thanks, Hello Shiny. Um, uh, next question. Um, uh, Bill says, um, I'm laughing at you hollering at the dog. Sounds like me in my house. Yeah, they, they are naughty sometimes. Um uh, Kevin says, thanks for all you do, Gav. Need to cut the session short as I'm doing Christmas baking. See you next week. Thanks, Kevin. I will see you next week, mate. No problems at all. 
Uh, we've got 10 minutes to go. Um, oh, sorry. There's, um, oh, so Finca says, four alarm cheddar has jalapenos, uh, cayenne pepper, I think, yeah, ground pepper and red pepper flakes with seeds. Sounds very hot. And yes, indeed, bring the fire truck. <laughs> Sounds a bit like the triple pepper, Jack, am I? Um, Annette says, hello, Annette, lovely to see you. Um, hi, Gavin, I made a rookie error yesterday when making kefili. I actually uh, accidentally used calcium chloride instead of rennet. I didn't have my glasses on. You can imagine my shock uh, when no curds appeared. How horrible would this cheese be? Uh, uh, calcium chloride is a little bit bitter. So you may find if you've like double dosed the calcium chloride, I think that's what you're saying, and you didn't have rennet, so you had to add it later. Um, how horrible will this cheese be? Well, sounds like you probably got a firm curd set eventually. Um, with all that calcium chloride, it may be a little bit bitter, but you won't know that until the cheese is ripened. But look, ripen it, it may be the best tasting cavilla you ever had, Annette. So, um, I find these little mistakes sometimes turn into the most amazing cheeses. Um, James says, um, hello, can you make Talita cheese in your next video. I think that's the ones that are from Spain and they're shaped like breasts. They're raccoon and they've got a little nipple at the top. I think that's what you're saying. I think that's the one, James. Uh, I would have to get a special mold and I think it uses sheep's milk as well and I don't have any of that to hand very much. Um, uh, Ramesh says... Um, hi, Gavin. I have mould under the lard slash cheesecloth wrapping of my cheddar. It's about two months old. Um, look, it may be difficult to take that cloth off, um, Ramesh, but how do you know that it's under there? Is it feeling a bit squishy or something? I found that at about the six-month mark for mine uh, because I didn't use lard. I used coconut oil and there was way too much mold growth. It wasn't very good. Um, uh, so what you're going to have to do is take the cloth banding out, cut that bit off, maybe then vacuum pack it for the rest of its maturation period because uh, there may have been a, obviously a pocket of air or something like that underneath where the mold had grown in. So try that, Ramesh. Hopefully that fixes everything. Um Jim says, um, your feta in the gallery, you mentioned 30%, oh, sorry, 30% used milk and 30% some other, you never said what the remaining 40. Sorry, Jim, I made a mistake. So it was 70% used milk and 30% goat's milk. So, yeah, so that was the combination. And that's the uh, official uh, PDO specific specifications from that. Um, so, yeah. Uh, sorry, Jim. Yeah, so sorry for any confusion I caused there. 70% used milk, 30% goat's milk. Amazing flavour. Blow your mind. Tastes like proper real feta from Greece if you get the real stuff, not the, you know, the stuff that other cheese artisans make that aren't PDO. Okay. Um, Fairy Tale After Dark says, Hey, Gavin, have you ever smoked your own cheese? It's something I'd love to try with my first cheddar or hard cheese. All the best from the UK. Paula. Thank you, Paula. Um, no, I haven't smoked my own cheese. Um, I do have a little smoking kit, and I've got one of those hood barbecues, so um, I should get around to it. It's got to be winter. It's, not, uh, it's a bit too warm at the moment to smoke cheese here. <clears throat> but um, there is a very good video. If you pop over to Cheese 52 channel, uh, which is run by Lisa, she actually did an experiment on smoking cheese. And what she did, and I've watched the video a couple of times now, it's really good. She made a cheese and smoked it before she matured it. And then she, she made a cheese, I think they were both Gouda, I think. Um and then she smoked another one after the uh, the cheese was mature. So before the cheese was mature, after the cheese was mature, compared the two, uh, and she said the flavour was better and more distinct with the cheese that 
she smoked after it came out of the press, uh, before she matured it, and more depth of flavour. Sure, the other one was smoky, but really only on the surface of the cheese. Uh, I think she smoked it for two hours per kilogram of cheese, but it's a good video. I, I'm sorry, unfortunately, I don't have the link because we don't have Kim here today. But yeah, go to the Cheese 52 channel and look at smoking cheese. Just do a search in the channel and you'll get some great information there, Paula. All righty, um, nearly the end of the show. We've got oh, five minutes to go, a couple of questions. Um, uh, Darlene says, which kit and tools do you recommend for a beginner with nothing to start with? And that's the um, curd nerd light again. Thank you. To Liana, I will get to your question in a second. Um, tools uh, to use. So, you know, as far as kits go, I've got lots of kits. You can see them all behind me here. Um, but one of the simple beginner's kits is the hard cheese making kit. Do I have any in stock? Uh, no, they're coming tomorrow, apparently, uh, from the wholesaler. I've sold out, unfortunately. But, yeah, that's one it has got quite a few of the pieces of equipment that you need. Um, but, you know, most of the kitchen stuff that you have, um, you know, like a stir stainless steel stirring spoon, we have all that sort of stuff at littlegreenworkshops.com.au that we send to a few countries now. Um but, um, yeah, so a lot of the stuff in the kitchen are the, are the best sorts of things to use, and that way it'll keep the cost down as well. Um, but, yeah, get yourself a beginner's cheese-making kit. There should be in the description what tools to use as well. Okay. Uh, so, Liana Superchat, she says, um, what inspires you to make a new cheese? I have – I'm having cheesemaker's block. Uh, I've made all of my favourites but not sure – what to make next. Okay, Liana, what, this is what I do. Um, so I go scouring the internet, books, and all that sort of stuff. I've got tons and tons of cheese-making books just looking for recipes that are unusual, something that I can't buy in the supermarket. Or if I went to a cheesemonger here in Australia, something that I couldn't buy, per se, even though the cheesemongers here in Melbourne, there are some fantastic a varieties of cheese but they're expensive if you want to try something different that you can't buy yourself uh, locally then go and try hang sorry hamish down mate please go and try something that you've never tasted before sounds unusual so give it a go anyway so that's what i do um so if you've never tried a washed rind cheese before i highly recommend trying tilsit uh, it'll blow your mind. It is amazing. A little bit stinky, but not as bad as, say, Brick and um, Limburger, which are, you know, a little bit on the, more on the stinkier side. Tilsit is made with a thermophilic culture, so it's a firmer paste. It tastes really nice. And the, the ripening bacteria, brevi bacteria linens, really does help soften the paste and it tastes amazing. Try something you haven't tried. You know, give it a go. Like I said, the flavours of cheese are worldwide. They are amazing. Um, we got John from Blackpool in the UK and a former Currenjang resident. Oh, my God, goodness. So many people are having trouble how to say Currenjang, but it's, you know, it's not that hard. Um, uh, <laughs> your question is, uh, regarding the mould size for various cheeses you make, is there a concise area on any of your blogs that explain the mould size and the quantity needed, um, say, when... Is there a second part? Hang on, you cut it off. Uh, hang on, because it was too big. Uh, it said, say, when brides or other soft cheeses, uh, when making different varieties from, say, 10 litres of milk. Uh, cheers, Gavin. I love your programs. John, thank you, John. Um, look, so... Uh, I think on the, our website, we do mention the amount of milk or curds or whatever that is suitable for each sort of basket size. Um, my favourite basket is the 165 millimetre basket that we sell at Little Green Workshops. Um, and that caters for between 8 to 12 litres of milk. Um, and you get a decent sized cheese out of it. It's a decent sized basket. And it just happens to fit under the cheese press that we sell as well. Um, so that works really well. Um, so 
Yeah, most cheese baskets will say in the product description, uh, you know, the volume of curds or the weight of curds that they take. So hopefully that helps, mate. Um, but yeah, like I said, the 165 basket, and unfortunately we don't ship to the UK or the EU due to their sales tax laws. Uh, for my small business, it's just too time-consuming and unprofitable, unfortunately, to sell to those countries. So sorry about that. Hope that answered your question. Um, oops, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, got some questions that are appearing. Uh, Patricia sent a question, but I can't see it on my other dashboard. She says, um, just before we go, oh, and it's time to go. If you're looking for a list of cheeses to try making, have a listen to Monty Python's Cheese Shop Sketch. Indeed, it's a great little sketch. I think it's even on YouTube somewhere. Anyway, Hamish is telling me he wants to go outside again. So we'll call the end of the stream there. Thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, Hamish, shush. Uh, if you want to get your cheese making supplies, you can pop over to littlegreenworkshops.com.au. We ship to quite a few countries now. Um, so go and check that out. Uh, and don't forget, the year, there is a course, the beginner's course, over on the Curd Nerd Academy, courses.littlegreenworkshops.com.au. Uh, it's fairly cheap as far as cheese making courses go. And there are nine different cheeses to make and lots and lots of information um, on how to learn how to make cheeses. Last but not least, you can go to the merch store, pick up some cool merch. I haven't got a T-shirt on at the moment, but there's lots of stuff over there. Links on YouTube are down below in the merch shelf. Anyway, thanks for watching, everybody. I will see you next week. Hopefully, Kim will be the moderator. See you later. Bye.